Sydney Harbour is huge. 270 kilometres of foreshore meander around its coves and headlands, from the sea and up the Parramatta River. Ball's Head is one of the more unusual peninsulas, and not just because it's covered with trees. On the map, it looks a little like a seahorse sticking out into the waterway, separating Berries Bay from Ball's Head Bay. Just to the west of the peninsula, the harbour divides into two estuaries, the Parramatta River and the Lane Cove River. The whole place was once a river valley, but the sea started filling it around 10,000 years ago when glaciers thousands of miles away melted. Aboriginal people were here even as the seawater was rising. Ball's Head became an important place for the local Gamaragal people. The men and women fished the waters around the headland, and the women also collected shellfish. The ideal setting for a sustainable environment. There's water, uh, there's food, um, there's plenty of vegetation. Uh, the vegetation that would have been here in the past was very similar to what it is now, but there would have been a greater diversity of tree species, especially eucalypt species. They've been quite lost throughout the headland um, after the clearing that happened uh, earlier in the last century. The natural rock overhangs provided shelter and a place to make tools and create art. There is evidence that at least one Aboriginal person was buried on the peninsula. Up on top, there were probably views up and down the waterway. And here, someone took time to carve the shape of a large fish, or possibly a whale, on the sandstone. As you can see from the carvings, a whale is um, a significant animal for this area. Um, it could have been a totem. This world was turned upside down by the coming of Europeans. Some Aboriginal people fought the newcomers, but there were also friendships and alliances. The Gamaragal man, Caradar, made friends with an Englishman called Lieutenant Ball, who had helped to survey the harbour and explore the country on its northern shores. For his contribution to King and Colony, the Lieutenant was immortalised by the naming of the headland, Ball's Head. The first fleet was followed by another, and then more ships. 30 years later, without treaty or compensation, much of the land of the Gamaragals had been divided up and given away to colonists. The merchant, Edward Wollstonecraft, got Ball's Head and more than 200 hectares around it, back up to Crow's Nest, where he built a cottage. After his death in 1831, the estate passed to his sister Elizabeth and then her husband Alexander Berry. As Sydney grew to become a major port, many people hoped that the Berry estate foreshore might turn into a mirror image of bustling Darling Harbour on the opposite shore. Wind may have powered most of the ships that arrived throughout the 1800s, but steam engines were driving vessels by the end of the century. The first paddle steamer that worked the harbour appeared in 1831 and was called quite appropriately the Surprise. Even more surprising perhaps was the fact that it was built locally in Neutral Bay. It was a coal economy. Coal powered the steam engines of ships, trains and ferries, of mills and factories. It cooked food and warmed houses. In North Sydney it made the gas for lighting well into the 20th century. Well, early in the days, when I was young, uh, they had uh, fuel stoves and used the coke and the coal in the, in the, and wood off the beach and the, and the, the cooking stoves. And... New South Wales had plenty of the fuel. There were mines at Newcastle and mines around Wollongong. There was even coal to be dug from under the harbour. In the 1890s, plans to tap the Cremorne seam were stopped but they went ahead of Balmain. By then, old Alexander Berry was dead and his foreshore land at Berry Island and Ball's Head was about to pass back into government hands. 
there were renewed calls to create another Darling Harbour. Off Ball's Head, the water is very deep, second only to the channel between Blues Point and Dawes Point. It's a good fishing spot and an ideal place to dock big ships. In 1913, the Union Steamship Company was looking to build a coaling wharf there. The newspapers thought it was an ideal use of government land and the deep water around it. The land was leased to the Sydney Coal Bunkering Company, a subsidiary of Union Steamship. Bunkering means filling the ship's bunkers up with coal so they could, they had stokers in those days and they used to throw the coal into the boilers and away they went. Not everyone was pleased. The poet, Henry Lawson, had lived locally off and on for years. He thought the place was a bushy haven for the working class he mixed with around North Sydney. They're taking it, the shipping push, as all the rest must go. The only spot of cliff and bush that harbour people know. The spirit of the past is dead. North Sydney has no soul. The state is cutting down Ball's head to make a wharf for coal. And strings of grimy trucks shall run in everlasting trains. And on the cliff, where wild trees are, shall stand the soulless cranes to dump their grimy loads below. Where the great brown rocks are grand, and the deep grass and wild flowers grow, and boating couples land. How Henry would have seen it would have been a lot more beautiful than we have it today. Lots more flowers and uh, yeah, the animals would have been here as well using all those plants. You would have sat here and heard all the different parrot species and little hummingbirds and things like this. The Mead Morrison Company that supplied the equipment for the loader sent out engineers to supervise its installation. The machinery was American, but the steel for the wharf was Australian, made at the Hoskins Steelworks in Lithgow. Just preparing the site was a huge job. They couldn't just tunnel into the natural sandstone, so concrete and fill was used to construct the platform and the tunnels beneath. The seawall was faced with cut stone blocks. In the process, a road was built over part of the Aboriginal carving. Progress, it seems, was more important than preserving the past. The Sydney engineer, Francis Stowe, helped design the 170 metre wharf that supported the loading gantry. It was built for big ships with bracing that could support the weight of the superstructure on top and sustain the buffeting of a ship alongside. Stowe was a big thinker and he was clearly giving a lot of thought to the potential for Ball's head. In 1922, he patented an extraordinary triple span Sydney Harbour bridge design that connected Ball's Head to Millers Point and Balmain. It was a cheaper option than John Bradfield's bridge and, had it gone ahead, Ball's Head would have been a different place again. In 1926, most of the rest of Ball's Head became a public park after the local community and the North Sydney Council urged the state government to save it from development. By then, however, there was not much bush left. Whether through wharf construction, wood gathering or fire, the headland was bald. As a child, I always thought it was actually bald head, uh, not bald's head. Because uh, I was aware a little bit later of the replanting that had gone on 20 or 30 years before. Huge numbers of trees were planted in the 1930s under the leadership of early environmental campaigners like Walter Froggatt and National Trust founder Annie Wyatt. They helped to turn a barren headland into a forest again. They planted many different species. They planted uh, Acacia alata, which is a tall, long-lived acacia. We had them scattered throughout the whole headland actually, and only in the last few years did they start senescing and dying off. The Ball's Head coal loader was one of the most advanced in the Southern Hemisphere. Like the new finger wharves in Darling Harbour and Walsh Bay, the Ball's Head coal loader symbolised the emergence of a modern harbour. Where before coal lumpers had to load the waiting steamers by shovel, the Ball's Head facility filled their bunkers automatically. Two huge gantry sliding cranes lifted the coal from colliers that had steamed down from Newcastle.
The collier would come in, the numbers you see along the wall was the place they'd say, have the bridge at number six or whatever. And that, that would relate to the uh, area where they wanted to discharge that particular cargo. The coal went down through these hoppers and they had car loads downstairs on rails and they'd shake the coal in and load the trucks as the trucks went round and round and round. You see the tracks up there about that way, about 18 inch, 20 inch gauge railway and used to go round and was on a continuous cable. And the cable would come down, go through the, the electric mode and go up and that's what drove it. And all automatic, you know, the blokes didn't have to uh, be on their toes to make sure the coal fell into the, into the hoppers and all that business. Each car was automatically weighed, so the entire load could be regulated. In early 1921, hardly a year after operations began, the Balls Head coal loader was breaking records, delivering nearly 2,500 tonnes of coal in under 20 hours. Work rates like this came at a cost. As the records were broken, locals were already complaining about the noise that the loader made as the skips and gantries banged away all through the night. It was very noisy. There was a big gantry crane there, of course, unloading the coal, and uh, great thumping when, when, the, uh, when it hit the, the bottom of the hold of the ship and scooped the coal up. These chaps on these car loaders underneath this concrete business here, that'd be the biggest noise going, you know, because they'd bump, 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 shake, and then bang, the truck would come and bang, you know, and they'd start again, you know. The, the noise packed was when, when it went up and when it was stockpiling, it, it, it'd come out and load up and then let go, and of course all the big chunks of coal would come crashing down into the heap. So there, there was that bit of sound, but I can remember the dust more than the, more than the, the sounds of it. It was dirty, you had to have a shower every night, you couldn't go home in the bus or anything like that, you know, because the coal, you know, just with a greasy sort of business all over you. All around the door jams of the, up the path there uh, used to be black, you know, all, all around the doors. The complaints would continue for the next 50 years. The coal loader replaced much of the manual labour, but men still had to trim the black lumps inside the ships, pushing them into the corners of the holds. It was dirty work, and in the depression times of the 1930s, men queued at the site in the hope of getting casual jobs. You had to go in with a shovel and you'd get in there and they'd drop all the coal and you had to shovel your way out. We always said the place was dirty, but the money was clean. In 1934, the lease was taken up by the Wallera Coal Company, which had a mine near Newcastle and a wharf on the coast there at Catherine Hill Bay. They would operate the loader for nearly 40 years. Bill Sim was an engineer on one of these ships, the Wallera. His wife Norma recalls visiting her husband at the loader. One had to stay on board while the coal was being unloaded. I would go down and spend the night with him on board the ship. But it was quite an adventure getting down to the ship because he would meet me at the gate at the top and guide me across where the gantry um, would drop the coal onto that area, making big coal heaps, uh, and then we'd have to negotiate that. Go down a very steep ladder down the side of the sandstone wall, and then uh, wait and dodge across the wharf uh, when the crane wasn't moving overhead, and then down into the ship. Life for a collier's crewman was dangerous. At least 119 coal carriers were lost off the New South Wales coast between 1850 and 1950, an average of more than one a year. Shortly after Bill Sim left the Wallera Company, he did an extra shift on the old blackened collier called the Birchgrove Park. The ship went down in bad weather off Narrabeen in 1956. My husband was one of the ten men who uh, were drowned uh, in the sinking of that ship, and my husband was never found. There were dangers on land as well. In 1940, Sydney was suddenly struck by a vicious storm. The papers called it a hurricane. The 75 mile an hour came in and it blew the gantry along the, the railway lines, the brakes wouldn't hold it. And uh, when it hit the stops at the end, it collapsed over the the wharf, the chap that was driving the 
Gantry just missed the end of the war and was killed. The coal loader was in poor shape after the war. There was an upgrade in the mid-1950s when a new grab transporter was installed, designed and built by the Melbourne-based Moore Crane and Engineering Company. When I came here, the old bridge was here, when the, the original bridge, and just after I arrived here, they built the new bridge. The old bridge was a DC bridge, and the, the new one was an AC bridge. They used to break the, the AC power coming in for the generators to uh, convert to DC. When I first got into the trade, there were something like 18 or 19 ships running coal from Newcastle to Sydney. Years of coal loading, with all the resulting spills, had led to a shallowing of the harbour around Ball's Head. The maximum tide, maximum we used to load a ship here was about 12 metres. The harbour floor was dredged in 1959 and again in 1963. The discharge of polluted ballast water was another problem at this time as the shellfish started to disappear from the wharf piles. But there were still fish to be caught if you were adventurous enough. Uh, it was going down underneath the wharf for, for doing the fishing it was a real adventure for kids, I think, because uh, once again it was an operational wharf at the time. And apart from the steady dust coming down off the, the wharf above you, uh, and of course you could look down into the, into the harbour, which was still pretty clear then. You could actually see the fish and get mussels off the, uh, off the piers as well. In the 1960s, steamers were disappearing from Sydney Harbour, replaced by bigger oil-burning vessels, just as the steamers had replaced sailing ships. So the need for bunkering ships lessened. The place had sold coal to local hospitals and laundries since the 1930s, and this also ended as electricity, gas and oil took over. Work at the coal loader fell away until the 1970s, when the place was completely refitted to supply export coal to Japan. The Wallara Coal Company in the 60s was sort of on the wane and that's why they were taken over by Coal and Allied. Coal and Allied had a contract with Ubay Industries, who were the major cement makers in Japan. And uh, the Wallara type coal, which was a steaming coal, about 14% ash, um, it was ideal for their cement making in Japan. And uh, the 50,000 tonne was about as big as Ube could take and certainly as big as we could take. Later, the jetty was lengthened to accommodate larger colliers. The gantry used to travel up and down the wharf. We couldn't move the ship because well, already the stern would be hanging over the end anyway, you know, the bridge. They only have the actual hatches alongside the wharf. It was a new era. There were far fewer workers employed than in the 1950s, and those that remained finally got protective clothing and goggles. Work that once went all through the night now stopped at 11, after 50 years of complaints from local residents. And coal was chemically treated to reduce the dust that used to black and wet washing all around Waverton. The piles were then hosed down with water to help dampen the dust even more. Management took public relations tours through the site to keep the locals on side. By the 1990s, technology and social change spelled the end of operations at the Ball's Head coal loader. The world had not lost its appetite for coal. In fact, it had never been greater. But that meant exports directly from Newcastle in ships too large to dock at Ball's Head. Sydney Harbour was changing too. The coal-fired power stations that dotted the foreshores had already been redundant for years. Now other waterfront industries were leaving for cheaper land at Newcastle or Port Bodney. As leases for industrial sites came up for renewal, the working waterfront gave way to residential development, offices and sometimes even parkland. Sydney was no longer an industrial port and hardly a working waterway at all. The much newer Balmain coal loader on the opposite side of the harbour closed in 1990. Oil storage on the eastern side of Ball's Head stopped in 1994 after more than 70 years. By then, the last collier had pulled up at Ball's Head. The ships took on their final load of coal in 1992. The state government commissioned studies on possible uses for the redundant peninsula sites. 
Many in the local community were sure of one thing. They did not want housing developments like the ones that had been built on other vacated waterfront sites. Realising that the whole peninsula had a series of industrial sites falling vacant, we uh, began to mobilise uh, in the late 80s. What we did was set up a task force with council and representatives of the relevant state government bodies and we worked on the process to optimise the public use of the, uh, of the whole of the peninsula, including the coal loader here. North Sydney Council backed local efforts to have the coal loader and BP sites turned over as foreshore parkland. There were meetings between community representatives, state government and council, and passions ran high. Whilst the future of the coal loader site was in limbo, it was home to a very different type of enterprise. The state government leased the area in 1994 to a caretaker, who used the old powerhouse building as a base for their pioneering environmental remediation business. We were, had to lay everything up here. We had to lay the power, we had to redo the telephone, we had to lay um, the gas, because the gas was never up here. Six months after the company moved in, the, the family moved in, and we moved in with um, four children ages from, at that stage, from six to 11. The site itself was in need of remediation to remove toxic chemicals. So the new tenants set about this job. They turned an old oil tank site into a wetland. Meanwhile, the community was still battling to save the sites from development. The protests and negotiations with the state government finally paid off when the Premier, Bob Carr, announced that the coal loader, along with the BP site and several other obsolete industrial waterfronts, would be dedicated to public recreation. He was following in the footsteps of Premier Jack Lang, who had created the Headland Park 70 years earlier. It was a landmark announcement that was celebrated locally and throughout Sydney. I think this is a classic case of where communities have to lead on uh, maintenance of public lands. And if they're vigilant and work hard and lead councils and state governments, uh, then they can mobilise public opinion to support these places. The Premier's statement set the guiding principles for the development of the old harbour sites. But there was still a lot of planning work to make that vision a reality. The land had to be rezoned, planning legislation had to be drafted, and North Sydney Council, which was going to control the area, had to prepare a master plan for the peninsula. The state government and council needed to talk to the local community and other interested groups. So a committee was set up to work out the details of what the parks would look like. There were public meetings and concepts were put up for comment. Then, after nearly two years of negotiation, a master plan was adopted. The details still had to be decided and the money found to realise the great ideas. Construction of the BP site on the opposite side of the peninsula was completed first in 2005. Council worked closely with BP Australia to create a unique post-industrial parkland. Attention then turned to the coal loader and there were more workshops and exhibitions so that local opinion could be heard. Plans were approved in 2007. New life would be breathed into the coal loader by following the principles of sustainability, of living in harmony with our environment. The new ideas were reflected in a new name. The Coal Loader Centre for Sustainability was going to be a grassroots place to visit a place where you could meet others interested in new technologies and old ecosystems. Where you could grow plants for your garden to create native havens for animals that once flourished in North Sydney. We put sustainability as an overreaching aim of the Council's vision and aim of the 10-year the plan. So everything we do, sustainability has to be um, embedded in what we do. The first step was to reuse as many of the existing structures as possible, to adapt them to new roles. The old buildings were reconfigured for energy efficiency and solar panels fitted. There were water tanks installed. The place became a working example of what could be achieved at home and work. The coal platform and tunnels were also retained. No one wanted to erase the memory of the working harbour, 
some actually regretted its passing. So the Great Rock Built platform remains as an example of the industry and technology that once lined the harbour. The one we opened as part of the uh, works we've completed in 2010 was very significant because it recreated that link back with Ball's Head that had been missing since the early 1900s. The, the site had been severed for so many years and to finally open that up again was quite a significance. At the Coal Loader Sustainability Centre, the old infrastructure of coal that powered our economy for 150 years has been overlain with new clean technologies that reduce pollution and energy use. But just outside, there is another overlay that has been removed. The road that covered the ancient carvings has been dug up to reveal what is left of this remarkable collection of images. When that happened in 2008, the Aboriginal community spoke about the discovery of an old friend. When that road was put across those much loved carvings, that was the expression of a value system. By uncovering those much loved carvings, we're expressing something else. In a sense, that was the first turning of the sod. It was such a meaningful event, a reconciliation of the damage that had been done to the engraving site. The recovery of this gamma ray carving symbolised the purpose of the Sustainability Centre. For nearly a century, this site has been given over to the supply of coal. Now, the world confronts the difficult issues that have arisen from centuries of burning carbon-based fuels. Problems like pollution and climate change. And the old coal loader is being used to promote 21st century technologies that might help solve these problems. It's not quite a full circle, back to the time when the Gamma Ragel walked lightly on the headland, taking only what they needed to sustain themselves. But Henry Lawson might be pleased with the reincarnation of his beloved bald's head. Here with its tracks and tangle, here with its peaceful hush, the gums, the scrub and the grasses, the wild Australian bush. Here in the heart of Sydney, surrounded by care and strife, is the twitter of birds a-building and the hum of insect life. Pabiaguri, Pabiaguri, Pabiaguri Nadi.